straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The local police department using podcasts to try to solve murders from a 2015 unsolved fatal shooting to the 1996 cold case of a teen's murder. She did not deserve that. She had a little girl. Heartbreaking testimony as an 11-year-old takes the stand against his stepfather describing the alleged murder of his five-year-old brother. He went in there and beat him like a suit. The Tiger King star is facing more legal trouble, why the big cat zookeeper says he needed to blow off steam after his exotic animals were seized. Plus, the prosecutor's theory for where the missing wife of a millionaire real estate heir might be buried, and how he's tying it back to the murder of Susan Berman and the trial of Robert Durst. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A police department in Florida is hoping a new podcast could help crack murder cases that have gone cold. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with two stories of two different killings. Yeah, Brian, po podcasts, as you know, are incredibly popular, especially among true crime fans. So the Boynton Beach Police Department in Florida hopes that the podcast could be the key to finding Victoria Miller's killer. She had a sweet soul. Alexis Miller was only eight years old when her older sister, Victoria, was murdered in May of 1996. She was a good person. Deep down, she was, she was a mom, a sister, and a daughter. Sarah Miller was only 10 when Victoria died. And I just saw it, it the way it broke my mom's heart. And it's really, that's, I think, what sticks out the most, what it did to her. Victoria's body was found in a field in Boynton Beach after she went missing. Her throat had been slashed. She went to a party and nobody saw her again after that. Um, a few days later, she was found in a field. She was naked and wearing only shoes. Boynton Beach police detectives want to close Victoria's case once and for all. We had an intern come in and, and generate this podcast idea. and We thought it was a great idea. Um, and she did an excellent job on, uh, at it. The Rosebud podcast tells the story of Victoria's murder. Anything, no matter how small it may be, could help us out tremendously. Boynton Beach detectives also want to solve the murder of Edward Morton, who was shot at the door of his mother's home in 2015. She has begged for clues in the past. This is my second son that got killed. I don't know why Edward was killed, but I would love to know why. Police say the shooter came to the door of the home and asked for Edward. His brother Christian can't identify him. This sketch came from his description. That's what we think will, will lead to this case being solved, is, is somebody knowing what happened and, and just telling us, and then hopefully we can show a uh, picture to Christian and he can identify them. Now, Boynton Beach police would also like to use a podcast to help generate some clues in Edward Morton's case as well. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is the editor of CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis and Terry Austin. Carrie, what about this podcast makes it so intriguing and possible for true crime experts such as yourself to help? I think this phenomenon of citizen sleuths, whether they're reporters, podcasters, documentarians, or authors, is, is part of our the explosion of media around the world. Um, if you think about Michelle McNamara and her efforts to solve the Golden State Killer case that uh, culminated in the arrest of, uh, of the Golden State Killer, or if you think about the work that Andrew Jarecki and Mark Smerling did with Robert Durst and a lot of the evidence that they accumulated in um, doing their film actually resulted in Durst getting arrested for the murder of Susan Berman. Um, this is, a, you know, this is ever growing. And as the cost of the technology becomes less and less, it's much easier for people to get on the uh, get on the uh, on the trail of these crimes and help solve them. Absolutely. I mean, Terry, this is an intern from the police department who's host of the podcast and puts it all together. She believes that Miller being found with a tennis shoe was odd. What about this case stuck out to you as odd? Well, I thought that was odd, Brian, but I was struck by the fact that the system really failed Victoria. She was in different foster homes. She was, you know, subject to domestic violence. 
she didn't receive adequate treatment for her drug and alcohol abuse, and a loophole in Florida law enabled her to work in a topless bar at the age of 16. So I just think, overall, that's what strikes me about this case. The system really failed her. Yeah, seems like it. And Jeanette, what evidence do you please have in Victoria Miller's case? You know, they have had some suspects in the past, Brian, and they also have some DNA evidence. They wouldn't elaborate on what kind of evidence it is, but they do have the DNA. They just need a profile to match it to. And then obviously they would need something, uh, some other type of evidence to corroborate that DNA evidence. So they're really hopeful that giving this case a fresh look after 25 years could finally lead to her killer. Hopefully us talking about it here and people going to the podcast will help generate some buzz, generate some information to help crack those cold cases. Thank you, everyone. Now to Ohio, where a former TV star is charged with an alleged inappropriate contact with a teenage girl. Jared Drake Bell has pled not guilty to misdemeanor charges of child endangerment and disseminating matter harmful to juveniles. Police say the 34-year-old's arrest is related to a 2017 incident with a then 15-year-old at one of his concerts. Prosecutors say the teen had established a relationship with Bell several years prior. Bell, who now goes by Drake Campana, was on the Nickelodeon sitcom Drake and Josh. He's currently a Spanish language singer based out of Mexico. Bell is out on $2,500 bail and is due back in court on June 23rd. A suspect in a high-speed chase in Florida is accused of throwing a baby at law enforcement as he tried to escape. The Indian River Sheriff's Office says John Henry James III tossed the two-month child in an apartment complex. Dash cam and aerial helicopter footage shows part of the chase as deputies attempted a traffic stop. The sheriff says James ran over stop sticks and hit a detective's vehicle. Law enforcement then appeared to stand down when they followed James to a parking lot. According to the sheriff, James grabbed the baby from his back seat, throwing the child. The deputy caught the baby, who's reportedly safe and sound. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a Tiger King star is in some legal trouble. And this time, we're not talking about Joe Exotic. But first, an 11-year-old takes the stand against his stepfather in the murder trial of a 5-year-old autistic boy. The gut-wrenching testimony, next. Back turning now to Tennessee, where an 11-year-old boy is testifying about the night his little brother went missing and what led up to the arrest of his stepfather for murder. He went in there and beat him like a suit. Alex was just 8 years old when his brother, baby Joe, went missing. His stepdad, Joseph Ray Daniels, on trial for the murder of five-year-old Joseph Clyde Daniels. Alex has the defendant beat the boy with a whip. Then they all went back to sleep. Later that night, Alex says he woke up to a loud bang. I saw him laying on the ground. Who was laying on the ground? Joe. Joe Clyde? Yes. And what was the defendant doing? He, he was about to pick him up and carry him out the door. He said that he would tell me if I didn't help him. I saw him walking down the road with him. Carrying Joe Clyde? Yes. According to Alex, it all happened because of an accident. When you say that he peed in the floor, was that in the bedroom? In the bedroom, yeah. Okay. And after Joe Clyde peed in the floor, what did you do? I went and told. Told who? Him. And when you're pointing at him, you're pointing at the defendant? Yeah. In court, the now 11-year-old referred to his stepdad only as him and to his mother by her first name, Crystal. On cross-examination, the defense asked Alex if he initially had told a different story. Do you recall telling a different story? No, I actually do, but it was fake. It was a false story. The defense then played videos of Alex's interviews with child services shortly after baby Joe went missing, trying to show inconsistencies with his testimony. Does anyone get a butt whoop him? No. Yeah. Did Daddy ever butt whoop anyone? Yeah. Yeah, who would he butt whoop? Me, yeah. In another interview, Alex said no one told him what to say or not what to say. Prosecutors point to one striking comment, which they say could explain Alex's inconsistencies. The fact that Joe was missing made you feel scared, but you feel safe that Dad's in jail? Yes. Yeah. How do you feel now? What makes you feel confused? Why was Daddy so dope? Back with us is the editor of CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis and Terry Austin. Terry, you heard Alex's testimony. He was eight at the time of the incidents. Do you think his testimony was credible? I do, Brian, but it was very difficult to listen. It was very moving testimony. We know that Alex was very close to 
baby Joe Clyde, and they went on the bus together, and we remember the testimony from the speech therapist who said that they were close. But as far as his credibility is concerned, the inconsistencies are a problem. But what I'm hoping is that the prosecution will bring a psychologist to the stand and talk about how these inconsistencies might have occurred. The eight-year-old might have been afraid to speak out against his father, whereas now, three years later, he's 11, he has more clarity, and he has more courage. So if I were the prosecution, that is the way I would explain those inconsistencies. Now, Carrie, on the other side, the defense seems geared to point the finger at the mother. Do you think they'll argue Alex is just trying to protect his mom? Um, perhaps, although... A lot of it, uh, I think a lot of it depends on what the emotional tenor is of the witness. If, if that witness in the videotape seems scared and in articulating why his story changed expresses that he was in fear, then I think that will be compelling for a jury. I think the, it feels like the defense has a very uh, steep hill to climb on this one, Brian. Yeah. Now, Terry, what did you make of the cross-examination and the types of questions that the defense made against such a, such a young witness? I think he actually came a little bit too hard at this witness. He's very young. I think he's sympathetic, and the jury is listening to this. And when you come too forcefully against a very young witness, I think it is going to be used against the defense. And, uh, you know, here, I would not have done that. I might have even passed on that. Absolutely. Definitely a technique we talk a lot about here. And then watching the testimony, because, of course, Law and Crime covers uh, all of these cases gavel to gavel. We've got our commenters saying exactly what you're saying, Terry. So it's interesting that you picked that up, because I think a lot of people are as well. And an update to a case we've been following closely at Law and Crime. A judge in Iowa denied a mistrial request from the man convicted of killing college student Molly Tibbetts. Christian Beneja Rivera was found guilty of stabbing Molly Tibbetts to death and hiding her body in a cornfield. His defense said one of the state's witnesses watched the live streaming coverage of the trial, but the judge found the defense did not provide any example to prejudice from the viewing. The defendant is scheduled to be sentenced on July 15th. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, how the prosecution is alleging Robert Durst got rid of his wife's body in the 1980s. Plus, Tiger King stars Jeff Lowe's legal troubles are growing, his latest arrest for DUI, and claims he was blowing off steam after authorities seized his big cats. Next. Back, two of the stars of the Netflix series Tiger King are speaking out after their arrest for allegedly driving under the influence. Jeff Lowe and his wife Lauren were arrested Saturday around 1.50 a.m. in Oklahoma City. Police say they saw a white Range Rover with the license plate Tiger King jump a curb and leave a parking lot at a high rate of speed. Lauren reportedly was driving and pulled over at the cop's request, then spoke in a slurred speech. Jeff is accused of getting out of the front passenger seat, walking around, and then driving the car into a parking lot. According to the report, he had a strong odor of alcohol and blew a .18 at the police station. The couple is known for their appearance in Tiger King, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. Jeff Lowe and his wife took over the animal park once owned by Joe Exotic. Last month, federal authorities seized 68 lions, tigers, and lion-tiger hybrids from the park. A judge found probable cause the couple violated the Endangered Species Act as well as the Animal Welfare Act. Now, Lowe was taking to Instagram saying, quote, We want to apologize for the poor judgment we displayed. It's been a long, painful couple weeks losing our children the way we did. While burning off steam Friday night, we lost track of just how many people were handing us drinks. Back with us is the editor of CrimeStory.com, Carrie Antholis, and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, it seems like an open and shut DUI case to me. And what did you make of that uh, I, apology? Case closed, Brian. I mean, look, he had a strong odor of alcohol. He didn't pass the gaze test. He didn't pass the breathalyzer test. And, you know, the fact that he admitted to blowing off steam and he apologized for his poor judgment, I think, really is going to be used against him. And drinking while intoxicated is no joke. I mean, he could actually go to jail. He could, you know, have a suspension of his license. Certainly could be on probation. So this is a serious charge. Yeah. And again, he blew a 0.18. Just a reminder, the legal limit is 0.08. So 
just a little, 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 little over the top. Uh, Carrie, Tigers taken, DUI. Could this be the continued fall of the Tiger King's kingdom? Um, yeah, when, when you get involved with a documentary, you're rolling the dice. And when you get that kind of notoriety that a Netflix series will give you, then you're, you're standing on a pedestal and every misstep will lead to, you know, could lead to some misery. In this case, it led to people giving him drinks and it led to him getting arrested, it seems. Yeah, that's a high fall from a Netflix series uh, podium, I guess is, is the way to put it. Uh, thank you both for the input. And yeah, we'll see how this story of the Tiger King's kingdom continues as we'll probably hear more uh, for her legal troubles from both sides. But still nothing from Carrie ba Carol Baskin. Uh, when we come back, was a popular spot used by Tony Soprano's crew to bury bodies, also used by real estate heir Robert Durst? Why the prosecution believes a millionaire's wife's body is buried there ahead. Welcome back. Prosecutors of the millionaire real estate heir are revealing their theory for where Robert Durst's missing wife might be buried. Robert Durst is on trial in California for allegedly shooting and killing his lifelong friend, Susan Berman, in December 2000. Durst's first wife, Kathy, vanished from her New York home in January 1982. Investigators say Berman helped Durst cover up Kathy's death and was killed because she threatened to go to the police. Prosecutor John Lewin told jurors in opening statements that Durst buried Kathy in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, made famous by the TV show The Sopranos for the soil not freezing in the winter. A phone records analyst testified about four collect phone calls placed at or near the Pine Barrens to the Durst Real Estate Organization, two days after Kathy's disappearance. It's on February 2nd at 12.23 p.m. Again, the person is standing in Beach Haven, New Jersey, calling Van Dorn Realty, asking Van Dorn to pay for the call. Yes. The call is at February 2nd at 4.55 p.m., over four hours later, and now they're in Barnegat, New Jersey, and they're calling Van Dorn Realty asking Van Dorn to pay for the call. Yes. Are you familiar with where Beach Haven and Barnegat, New Jersey are? Yes. They were on a uh, on Long Beach Island, the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, the coast, Jersey and Shore. Pine Barrens is a, a very large rural area that very sandy soil. It's um, a lot of state parks. It's just a big, uh, you know, un. un not, not a lot of people live, or there's not a lot of businesses there. Is this a vast, remote area? Yes. Prosecutors also alleged Susan Berman called Kathy Durst Medical School, pretending to be Kathy, to help cover for Durst. But on cross, the defense asked, if Kathy made a quick phone call, would it even show up on the phone records? Hi, Dr. Cooperman. This is Kathy Durst. I'm not feeling well. I'm vomiting. I have diarrhea. I have a headache. I can't make my rotation. Would you please help me? Dr. Cooperman, yes, I will. I hope you feel better. Oh, and by the way, uh, Dr. Cooperman, I understand from Dean Cook that you might call me. Is that less than three minutes, Special Agent? The way you said it was, yes. Okay. And the way Dean Cooperman said it was also, but let me ask you this. Wait, I'll, yeah, I'll, with, I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw that. Well, just to complete your hypothetical, so <clears throat> so that wouldn't that wouldn't register here being a local call less than three minutes. All I could say is if whatever was said was under three minutes, it would not register. Kerry, what do you make of the prosecutor's overall theory now that he's added Durst got rid of Kathy's body, soprano style? Well, the it's a compelling argument to me. Um, the Pine Barrens uh, were have been a notorious burial ground for the mafia since the height of the Gambino crime family, when the mafia that we know from The Godfather was was at, at its height. Um, Susan Berman had very deep ties to the mafia. Her father was. A uh, was the mob liaison in Las Vegas after Bugsy Siegel was assassinated. She w might have known, she just written a book about her father, and so she might have known and had advised Bob about where to bury the body. Um, it, it's, uh, it's very compelling information. That combined with the fact that the New York City 
Detective Strzok's investigation of it was very compromised, and his testimony that was played last week, his pre-recorded testimony, was very damaging to the defense. And uh, my guess is that the defense was reeling all weekend from the impact of Strzok's testimony. On top of all of that, there's this thing called the dig note, um, or that's become known as the dig note, which Robert Durst has now acknowledged having written, which is a list of implements that could be used to bury a body, um, including um, the word dig, um, the, the word boat, um, the, the, the word shovel. And um, Durst um, has now acknowledged writing that, that combined with being down in the Pine Barrens and the disappearance of Kathy's body never to be seen, or the disappearance of Kathy Durst never to be seen, is, I think, very incriminating and, and uh, makes the prosecution's case very compelling. Now, Terry, the four collect calls, still circumstantial evidence, but a lot more direct than some of the evidence when seen otherwise. Does this give a clearer picture of the opportunity that Durst had to hide, Durst, to hide Kathy's body? Well, first, let me just say I agree wholeheartedly with Terry here. And listen, circumstantial evidence can be just as strong as direct evidence. Fingerprints are circumstantial evidence, but that might be stronger in some cases than witness testimony. So I think the fact that he was out at Pine Vines making those calls, strong evidence. Thank you both, and thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.